Well, welcome back. And I think as soon as they get our signal, why they're ready to roll for the next segment. Uh, Giacometti, the bus of Diego, the Giacometti TV hour about to commence here. <laughs> I'm the director of the Jack Committee Foundation in Paris. I've been working on this um, foundation for four years now, and I've been studying sculpture of the 19th century and 20th century for the past 20 years. Thank you. And I'm Michael Branson. I'm, I'm an art critic, and I teach in the Milton Avery Graduate School of the Arts at Bard, at Bard College. I'm Valerie Fletcher. I've been the curator of modern sculpture at the Hirschhorn Museum for the past 20 some years. I started on Giacometti uh, with his drawings in 1977, then did an exhibition in 1988, and finished my dissertation on his paintings in 1994. So he's kind of an ongoing thing. My name is Hans-Peter Marty. I'm coming from the Art Museum in Zurich. I'm involved with uh, Giacometti 25 years now, and I'm a conservator. professional beginnings, joined him there in uh, about 20, 25, 26, and then became his indispensable uh, assistant and partner and, and friend for the, the rest of Alberto's life. He was the, certainly the person he saw the most, the image he knew the best. He, he uh, Diego posed for him as a model between 1935 and 1940, pretty much every day. And then, and then after the war, he made all sorts of images of, of Diego in, uh, in painting and sculpture. And it was a connection to the valley, a connection to, to where he came from. And, um, and I, his, his images tended to be either from, either perceptual, so they were made from life, or from memory. And I tend to think this, this is an image from for memory, I think the uh, you know the whole apparitional quality of the image itself, the way the head seems to pop out of the butt, the uh, the mud of the body, almost like a mushroom, and um, and uh, the fact that it has such a guardian, such a stern guardian-like quality, almost as if that uh, he made an image that he wanted to look after him somehow, protect him. Um, I wanted to raise a couple of issues of the bronze. It just so happens. I have a, a, a remark that Janae made about the bronze and Giacometti that I think it's really that I think is really significant to keep in mind. It was an essay that Janae wrote in 1957 on the studio of Giacometti, and it was a very famous essay. And it it uh, it was made shortly after these bronzes were cast, and uh, apparently it was the essay that Giacometti himself preferred. So he's talking about uh, the uh, standing women, but I think it applies to the bronze in general. So, so uh, according to Genet, Alberto said, you saw them when they were plaster, you remember them in plaster. Genet said, yes. Do you think they lose something cast in bronze? No, not at all. Do you think they gain something? Again, I hesitate to say what best expresses my feeling. You'll think I'm being ridiculous all over again, but they make a strange impression. I wouldn't say they gained, but the bronze has gained something. For the first time in its life, the bronze has won out. Your women are bronze's victory over itself, maybe. Now, I think it, it's, uh, it, it's a comment that, that um, makes two points for me. First of all, that bronze was an issue, that anyone coming out of a radical or avant-garde tradition, a sculptor at that point in the century, really had to find a way 
to, to make bronze part of the essential content of the work uh, rather than just sort of part of the duplication. And the second point is that, that bronze is, is an essential material along with clay and plaster or maybe even more than, than clay and plaster. It's the essential material. It's, it's a material that allows Giacometti to, to, to congeal a sense of matter, to, to create a sense of, of base matter. It's a material that allows him to, to work the whole idea of survival into the work, the, the struggle with survival and maybe even the triumph over it. And just as important, it, it's, the, it's the issue of light. Because Giacometti's thought very much about as, uh, as someone who, who, who created a certain thickness in space, who psychologized space, who made space around the work as important as the work itself. And this depends on bronze, it depends on the patina, it depends upon the light. There's also the question of availability, because uh, the, the surrealist Giacometti, uh, the game boards like the On the Jeu Plus upstairs, the woman with a throat cut, the palace at 4 a.m., they create the impression of availability, the impression, the impression of participation, but not actual participation, which is one reason why I think Giacometti found the surrealist works precious in the end. Here, because of the surfaces, there's, there's the surfaces in the imagery, there's an actual availability. And the final point I want to make, and uh, it also touches on the politics of Giacometti's aesthetics, and that is that everything for him was, had a, whether it was a piece of paper, whether it was a chair, whether it was a towel, it had an irreducible identity. It had a uniqueness, it had a, a particularity. So there's something about the, the duplicating, the bronze process itself, the, the duplication of the image, but the creating the individuality within uh, the, the apparent sameness that's really important. And there, it's uh, this, this bronze here, which is the, um, I, I think in some ways, the most evenly patinated, uh, it's almost the most neutrally patinated, although it, it's a patination that really brings out the, the uh, kind of molten quality of the, of the bronze itself. But it's also a work that, that's painted. And here, the, the, the uh, He's left the accident in the work. He's left the burning uh, that comes out of the bronze and, and incorporated. He's left certain nodules and, uh, and blisters rather than removing them, which by and large he, he, uh, he did do in the others. You can see it here. But there's also a, a, there's almost a sense of petrification. It's, it's, when I look at this, I almost have the sense of, of watching water at the very moment where it turns to ice, where it freezes. And, uh, and this petrified quality, this petrified identity is very different than the, than the more liquid and molten quality of this one. And then the surface of, the, of this last one, which belongs to the Hirschhorn, is, is completely different again. It's, uh, it's, it's a shinier surface. There's almost a papery quality, a sort of caramel quality. It, it, it takes the light in a completely different way. It's hard to know whether it was fully patinated or whether it wasn't patinated. It's the one that, in my own mind, I have the most questions about. But the, the main point I want to make is, the, is the, within this duplication, the extreme individuality of each particular image and the way most of them relate back to different ideas of matter, to different ideas of nature. Cool. That's, that's, uh, that's very, very suggestive, eloquent reading, but um, I think will prompt all sorts of um, comments um, both here and, and in the auditorium, I suggest. Hans Peter, do you want to come in as a conservator now? So we are here really in another world than we were before with uh, Rodin and Rudier, how you told before. Uh, this also much a smaller piece, which makes it uh, in a way easier because it's just in one cast. It's not a, uh, in several uh, pieces, it's just one piece. And uh, we are also, which is also quite important, we are in another foundry. We are not more at Rudier, we are here now at the Swiss Foundation, the foundry in Paris, which makes a kind of differences. Maybe we can speak later about it. And then they're all Swiss. They are all Swiss, yeah. yes. I mean, the whole series. Yeah. And <clears throat> we see here the black one, which is the number one. And uh, by chance, the Hirschhorn one is number two. And the painted one, uh, which is number seven, which has the initials zero, uh, six, 
which means that in this row it is the last one. And uh, we have uh, the same sculpture in so different ways, the black one in the middle, this kind of, this kind of bronze patinated, which has definitely some kind of uh, coating on the surface, which came on later, because normally I have never seen a, uh, a surface like that in this kind of brilliance, except conservatives went on. And uh, you see this wonderful uh, coating, which is kind of, of liquid uh, painted on, oil paint, which is on this surface. And by chance, you see if it's always the same, if it's in a private collection, uh, a lot of uh, hand marks where the, the tops were rubbed off. So it gives a wonderful uh, idea how uh, uh, sculptures survive if they are really in a private collection. Good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, right. Some other comments. I'll leave it. Ronnie. A lot has been said on patinas, but I would like to draw the attention of uh, everyone here on the finishing of the bronzes, because due to the special shape of Giacometti sculpture, there are lots of recesses, and mm -hmm. in the casting process, this causes problems like mm -hmm. air bubbles. So mm -hmm. these air bubbles have to be removed at some point by chiseling after the cast is made. Right. And you can see the surface is much rougher than the other two. And I would like to know what you make of this in terms of uh, how you r respond to that kind of uh, Difference. Sure. Yes. <laughs> Have a response. A bold response. Well, since I've lived with the one from the Hirschhorn for a long, long time, yeah. and I've known the Nasher cast for a long time, and I've seen two of the other casts that aren't here, mm. um, my first response in seeing them all together for the first time was that the darker patina, as was mentioned as a kind of question or observation about the Rodans, is the darker patina causes a certain effect. Mm. And in the Rodan, it seemed to cause um, a greater difficulty in discerning the subtleties of the modeling of the anatomy, which are indeed very surface-oriented and subtle. In contrast, the, the darker patina here makes me see more clearly, and especially in the back, where the, the recesses are deep, that becomes much more obvious. He modeled this with his hands in plastiline, and then it was plaster and then cast in bronze. But you can see in all of them this downward streak here, you can see in all of them a kind of V incisions, because he also used a knife to cut into them. If you look in the back, I don't know if the camera can get to it, the back is, is almost volcanic. If you look at lava uh, as it solidifies, uh, you've got this sense that it really, as Mike said, it, it suddenly has congealed. But it's congealed with a sense of real activity. The hollows are very uh, deep and, and emphasized, whereas when you look at the back of the painted one, I don't get that same impression. I'm more impressed by the, the continuity of the oil paint covering it. And then when you turn to the Hirschhorn one, um, I see things, this is just, we're talking about perception, but visual optical per, per, perceptions. But that's really what Giacometti himself was seeing, all the different perceptions of the same model over and over again. This one, for example, when I stand back, I see most clearly that V on the forehead. Now, that may be partly because of the variegated model patina, but it may also largely do, be due to the fact that it had a layer of microcrystal and wax added before I became the curator there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that automatically makes it uh, certain of the highlights pick up the reflections, especially of artificial light. Yeah. Um, what I see here, just in these three, in leaving out the intervening num casts number three, four, five, and six, what I see personally is, is part of his, uh, really a perfect example of his uh, seeking of the different per perceptions, his own personal perceptions, subjective perceptions, some of them perhaps a little bit more objective, but always subjective to some degree. And so you have something here that is, it's the first one, and I can imagine, and that's all I'm doing is imagining, is that this comes in, and we know in 1954 he was now able to make uh, more than one cast at a time, sometimes all five or six at a time. And so this comes in and he sees a certain effect. And it has its own drama emphasizing the texture of the modeling. But perhaps it is not so much uh, allowing the face to stand out. 
And Mike, I need to actually, I think, correct you because when this uh, piece was bought very soon after it was made and exhibited, the invoice from the artist to the dealer and the dealer to Mr. Hirshhorn titled it as Diego, parentheses, study from life. Mm -hmm. And so for that, I go, okay, perhaps the artist looked at this and thought, well, looks like great lava, great chocolate brownie mix, but it doesn't perhaps give that sense of intensity in the face that he intended with this, mm -hmm. this V-like incision and the, the prominence of the nose and the lips. And to me, I see him going, okay, with his brother Diego saying, okay, we've got that one, we've got one with a similar brown patina, now let's see what we can do with that. And they started experimenting and playing with it. Mm -hmm. And that achieved a certain result. Mm -hmm. it's, it's uneven. I, I just, I'm sort of curious because the, you know, what you think of the surface, because it's, it's very, it, it, I mean, it does have this caramel quality, it's very paper, it's almost crinkly. And, uh, and as such, the, it, it, it really loses, uh, I, okay. I mean, I guess, I guess there's, there's a, you know, there's still a kind of, of, of liquid quality in it, but it loses, it definitely loses the kind of weight and mass yes. and, and sense of matter that, that both of those have. So I'm, I'm curious what you, what you think of that and, and uh, whether it makes sense to you. It does, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I've lived with it for a long time, and I don't know if the camera can capture what he's talking about, this thin, papery effect. In essence, in addition to the different colors in this patina, the brown, the greens, the, the earthy, yellowish, uh, ochre, almost orangey tones. You see areas like here where there's part of it been flaked off and you see the green layer underneath. And that sense of the flaking off of this uh, patina contributes, if doesn't, in fact, creates a sense of thin, papery, um, I guess what a conservator would call friable. It, it seems very, mm -hmm. if it weren't for the wax coating, it would seem very dry and does indeed flake off. There are areas where it flakes off right down to the, to the bare bronze. Um, the reasons for this, Veronique and I were talking about uh, just uh, this morning about the possibility that, that the patina being applied in an experimental manner with Diego knowing how to mix the chemicals and Alberto wanting to have a certain effect, that it was basically an on-the-spot uh, experiment and in terms of stability of the patina, it was not a success. Mm -hmm. In terms of the variegation, the kind of earthy quality it entails, it was a success, and I think what you're picking up on was not intended, but it has its own effectiveness, the sense of being delicate and, and papery and uh, almost older than it really is. Ernie. Yeah, I, I would just add that maybe stability was not Giacometti's main purpose, and when he painted the bronze, for instance, he used oil painting like the ones the, 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 that's on used on canvas, yeah. and of course it's not intended to be Ooh. used on bronze. And he certainly knew quite well that this was not uh, a standard procedure. Yeah, but also... And, and this was and painted um, considerably <coughs> later, wasn't it? It was painted in 1964, and yeah. I must add that at the time that Giacometti painted those bronzes, he painted other bronzes in the outside, knowing that these painted bronzes would remain outside under the rain and, and in weather conditions that are terrible. So, but yeah. also, you should remember, I think, as well, that mass is also a very vexed quality for Giacometti. And so to say that necessarily these are more massive and earthy, and this one less so, is also picking up on one of the things that he played with in his own, in his own sculpture, especially the post-war work. The relationship, for instance, between the thin figures and the heavy bases yeah. is a play of the, our relative experience of mass. With, with these, this yeah. narrow neck. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, and that's to bridge maybe the Rodin discussion to the Giacometti mm -hmm. discussion. One of the things that uh, Rodin and Giacometti are both interested in is the variability of the three-dimensional object when you view it from multiple angles. Mm -hmm. For Giacometti, this took on a metaphoric and philosophic level in that it became the difficulty of seeing another subject in some ways. And so the, we don't see the face as... I mean, this is a portrait bust in a very conventional format, the, yeah. the, the head and shoulders bust, but it's shrunken down so that we, we don't see it as a portrait, but rather the difficulty of actually discerning the face. And so that um, the variability amongst all the cast is a way of playing with that, saying the sculpture is not a fixed um, entity, but rather also this object of perception. So, oh, so, um, well, just uh, one formal quality we can point to is the way that in each of them, there's a bilateral distinction between the left and the right. And they're colored in such a way that, that um, 
in this one, for instance, it seems to work almost as a light source, that we have a light area and a dark area that implies a shadow across the face, a, a, a painted light source in that, whereas I see that not happening in this one. And I, I, that's something that we could perhaps talk about, the way that the colors are used to achieve different effects uh, in terms of the kind of environment in which he would have been seeing this as well. So. Actually, that raises a very interesting point because um, when Giacometti painted his bronze castle, she did it at certain specific times. I mean, occasionally do one or, but when he actually painted several at a go, um, it tended to coincide when he was uh, in a very intense period of painting, painting on canvas, and he just used the same brushes, the same colors off the same palette. Exactly. But it's not often known, it's a very rare experience, and it just occurred to me maybe, maybe they can make it happen here, mm -hmm is that if you take a painting that he did in his dim, dingy studio, which had a north light, but it was covered by an even dingier cloth, and then you take it outside and see it in the sunlight, it's astounding how different it looks. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what we're seeing a little bit here. I mean, I'd be very curious to see what this painted piece looks like in daylight compared to the electric like we have, because he, when he was painting the ones in the 60s, usually it was in exhibitions under artificial lights. When he painted the casts in 1950, it was in a studio and uh, for a deliberate experiment for exhibition, but he didn't take them outside. He hadn't seen them under strong electric light. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of curious. I'm curious about a couple of things. But because the, the faces look very, very different. And, and with the painting here, the, uh, the details, you don't lose the, uh, the detail. It keeps the, it keeps the detail of the eye, the cheek, you know, everything. And I don't know whether this is a question of light. Whereas, Whereas in the other one, certainly in this one, uh, because of the the, uh, the depth of the shadow there, you uh, it's dramatized. You, it's dramatized, yeah. and, and and it also it gives it a completely different personality. And yet, and, and over there, there's a different personality. Yet, uh, so I mean, they, they could be three different people or three different pe three different stages, three different personalities of the same person. But it, my question is whether you think that the painting there is in part to hold. Uh, to hold the every detail of the face and not to allow the, you know, the the, the face itself to be lost in shadow. Yes. Whether it's a protection against that. Yeah, or, I do mm -hmm. think so because one of the things he said, his letters haven't been published, and we have to piece together things, perhaps to a greater guesswork than there is with the Rodin. But he said in one instance when someone asked him why he was painting, I mean, using oil paints with flesh tints, the pinky taupe flesh tints, and he said it's because it makes them look more alive, it makes them look more real. Hmm. And it seems to be succeeding, just hmm. from our observations here. Hmm. What may be a way to think of it is not just to fix the traits of the face, but to fix the moment in which that face was visible to him. And that's the one, I mean, this is the one of the three that I, I, I feel does that the most. And maybe this is just my reading of the color in terms of a relative light source and shadow, but it seems to me that, that um, again, it's constantly with Giacometti is the struggle to, um, to see another, uh, another individual, another person, another subject. And the struggle with, with the image of Diego is very much that. One of the person who's probably mo the closest to him in his life, but yet there's a constant inability to see him fully. And so you can kind of, yeah. with this one, I almost see it as trying to capture the moment of the studio at that, at that point and, and that, that glimpse of the face, whereas Maybe, and maybe that's why I'm, I'm reading onto this being a later piece. If you piece see here. that, if, if, that's a, if the paint there really seals it in the present, and this doesn't, you see, because this whole, you know, he talked about this process of the li between, li between living and dying, or the actual movement, a scene, seeing a, a living person sort of move into the, into the stage of death. And I wonder then if you, if you see this as holding it in the moment, it's sort of in a living moment, and these actually moving a little bit more towards a, towards a death mask, that somehow the, the painting and the shadows itself would, would continue to reenact this process between life and death that he was always involved in. But that's, in a way, implicit within the whole bust format, mm -hmm. that, that, that you know, the whole idea of the bust is, is that, it, that it is an image, even if it's a living person, it will go on continuing as the image of a dead person mm -hmm. eventually. And it's also the question, uh, just briefly, sorry, that comes up again and again when we start coloring sculpture. Is it exactly yeah. this dialogue between the living and the dead um, yeah. in the 19th century that yeah. when you color something, it suddenly seems to be both more living, in some sense, but also much more inanimate because yeah. it then approximates a, what we see a lot more. For, for me, looking, looking at these, I'm being, being ignorant, <laughs> um, I, uh, but 
coming to it, you know, from, from earlier sculpture, I, I see the, the, the format of these being like those Cologne reliquary busts of around 40, 15, 1400, which, which are cut off at the shoulders. And they stand, actually learn this, on an altar. And, and they're, they're polychrome. This is probably completely irrelevant. But, but that's but, why I, don't, I think the perceptual issue is a difficult one, Valerie, because even if there, even if it is a study from life, there's a particular format. You know, there's a particular format, and there's an idea of building built into that format, and there's certainly an idea built into that head that he's working with. So, it's perceptual, but with 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 all sorts of qualifications. Yes, it's part of it's part of a series and part of his most uh, intense thinking about phenomenology and the and the the idea that one can never grasp at any one time any more than a. a an aspect uh, of a reality, a, a person, or a glass, or a table, or whatever. And he was getting very seriously into this question of phenomenology. It's when he began working more serially, making compositions in painting, drawing, and, and sculpture that were closer to each other in, in, in composition and size, so as to focus on the more uh, subtle aspects of it. And one of the things that, that emerges in, his, in studying his paintings is that he never expected there to be a final or definitive state. We all know that as kind of a commonplace truism about, about Giacometti. But when you see, say, three like this together, or like when you see, if you've ever get to see the, the paintings of Yana Ihara, there's six or seven, if you see three of the best, you go, oh my gosh, I see what he meant. There really is a sense of distance in this one, and there really is a sense of the aura of the space around it in, in the other. And I believe that this is, uh, an example of the kind of active interaction where he's having his brother perhaps uh, functioning as his hands in painting with chemicals, and there later saying, you know, acting for himself with paints in oil, and each one of them, just as the different busts are different perceptions one from the other, the, the casts with the different patinas are different perception, perceptual states than, than the so others. Can't do work can't exist without bronze. Indeed, he found, and he, sa he said when he couldn't do it in painting, he said he had to go back to sculpture always. Mm -hmm. That's better. I think uh, our discussion is also saying something about how it is exposed. I think if you see the two sculptures upstairs in the gallery, and if you look at this sculpture here, it's, they are looking totally different because on the upper level we have this great uh, light, which is also coming from the side partly. And if you see here, we have this kind of uh, artificial light, which is, in my opinion, a little bit too, top, too much from the top. So you see especially this kind of uh, upper parts of the sculpture. And the second thing is what we are thinking about for the last 10 years, uh, how to expose Giacometti. It's first never on two bright uh, pedestals, so we have them much more uh, uh, gray yeah. down, and also even the, the walls, uh, I mean, these walls here are quite good. Uh, normally you see this also in exhibitions like white walls, which are totally wrong. I mean, it is not as wrong with these three sculptures because they are not these thin figures where we have upstairs the, the femme and the, the grand debut. Uh, in this case, you won't see anything. If, if the, the, the eye is closing, if you have too bright shining the, fa the, the, the back from the walls, Exactly, and that was what we talked before, exactly. If you see in which studio he was working on, then you realize what his impression was, how to look at sculpture. That, I suppose that raises the question of where you see sculpture, and I suppose for a lot of sculptors, it's in the studio. The studio was the viewing place. And the studio is a very important part of Giacometti's work. Yeah. I would like to add something to what Valerie said about the aura, and it's true that the aura around this sculpture because of the roughness of the Phoenician is totally different from the aura that comes out of this very smooth surface and the uh, <coughs> kind of radiance that the painting gives. And this goes with what you were saying about trying to make uh, living forms, not yes. to capture the life, but really to make it alive. And you can see how he succeeded in both these instances and also this one. In quite different ways. In quite different succeed. ways. And these are three various uh, aspects of uh, a real uh, living being. The sculpture 
becoming a kind of living being. Not through realism, but through yes. other means. Exactly. Actually, I, I was just, I wanted, Mike started with a great quote, and I wanted to at least throw in a quote. Quick, 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 quick. Um, I think it's just, Okay. Um, he was interviewed late in his life, and he was asked about his patinas, and he said, you can't worry about patina. In the natural bronze, the light glances over the surface. It has a special character. When the metal is darkened, there are shadows and depths. Perhaps it's best to show several casts of a single piece, each with a different patina. But you can't get involved too much in the details, the tricks of patinas. Yes. And that's exactly what we're doing, so. Yeah, but can, I, can I just follow that with a, with a question, I suppose a rather basic question about the technique, because one of the things that, that comes across for me with these busts is they're sort of, they're, they're insistently modeled qualities. Oh, yes. yeah. um, and so you, 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 um, you read them, okay, you read them as bronzes, but you read them as modeled as squishy. Sculptures, as squishy yes. sculptures, yeah. yes. And, and, and so um, for me, when I first saw that, um, I didn't know the, the, the details of the chronology of when it or the circumstances which it had been painted. I assumed it had been painted to, to, as it were, bring out its ambiguity as a bronze, but also its potential to be read as a clay model. Um, that may not have been his intention. No, 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 but that's, that, that's, that's all, yes. That but you also have to realize that the painted one, because it's the last one, I don't know exactly what's really happened between this two and this one. Also, the bronze itself is softer. So if you look at, in the front side, there are a few holes from the, on, they are very good to see on the, on the two uh, first ones. They are no more to see here. So he was working on it. And if you look at, it's in several, in several parts, of the bronzes, it is softer. Even without paint, it's, it's a softer bronze. It's something a little bit different than the other tools. And the, bron uh, the paint makes it even more soft. Yes. And it, yeah. it is true in a certain way, because I really insist on the importance of chiseling at the foundry. And it's true that the, there is a kind of accuracy that can be lost through the process of, uh, of casting. But really, it's so much important, the degree of, uh, you know, all these bubbles that will, would, could be taken out. This could be done on the first cast or the last one. Exactly. Yeah. 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 You know, I just, I'm sorry, just standing here looking at them all in profile and sequence rather than directly in front or in back, it, there's more that appears the more you look. Uh, one of you, it may have been Hans Peter pointed out that in the painted one, for example, the neck becomes more noticeable. It's more, it seems longer, it's more taut, it has a more V-shaped, as if the head is more stretched upward and separate from the body. Whereas by the time you get down to the Hirschhorn one where the patina seems to almost camouflage that and the, the head and the, the torso are almost as one, even though the forms in measurement are the same. I think the question you raise about modeling, I mean, it's a whole, it's a sort of great subject. It's where he comes out of Rodin, too, in some yeah. ways, and takes it another point. But the, the whole resistance to preciosity that yeah. you're talking yeah, yeah. about, plus the importance of the, of the matter itself, the sort of, you know, liquid, sort of molten uh, quality of it. And, and I really do think these things were meant to be touched. I think, uh, you know, Janet talks about it in that essay, and it's, it's a problem in museums. But I think when he put these things in the world, that he really thought about them in terms of a kind of availability yeah. I mean, and, 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 and accessibility that, that, they, that maybe one or two works wouldn't have, but six or eight, yes. it, it, uh, you know, it, according to where they would wind up, so they would be there. They would be there in the, it, available physically for a kind of physical, intimate engagement in the way that the surrealist work promised but did not deliver. Yes, but on the other hand, it's in a great tradition of small-scale bronzes that were. I would like to add something about the plaster. Yeah. The difference with Hoda is that uh, there was one plaster made for this uh, bronze, and once the plaster was sent to the foundry, it was never shown again. So Hoda would make other casts, apparently, and Giacometti did not do that. So really what we're seeing now, that are the bronzes are the ultimate steps of a process. Mm -hmm. yeah. But also back to this question of touching just briefly, what's interesting is that um, the, the question of the tactile is so much related to, I think, the base, below the neck. 
uh, and that, that's where we see the, the traces um, of Giacometti's own process and where there's so much formal weight to the base. But it's exactly where the face, that, that the, uh, the site of subjectivity that becomes, where that becomes so much more difficult to imagine having that kind of intimate um, yes, tactile sure. relationship. I don't feel that way with those. I mean, with the, the painted one, I, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, but I'm you not can, sure. You can still see the marks like of the um, of the knife on the on the face and everything, but I mean, literally, just in terms of the weight of it, it's it's much less. There's much less to grab onto, yeah. and I think that can, we can tie back into Giacometti's um, to some of the subjects that he's thinking about while yes. mm -hmm. uh, while doing these, because I, I think it's a very important yes. point. Is what I'm saying. Well, there's well, also different kinds of tactility in mm -hmm. the sense that, for example, with the, the Rodin Age of Bronze or Michelangelo's David. I don't know about every other viewer, but my first desire is to go up and rub my hands over them. <laughs> Whereas this is a kind of off, it's both inviting and it's off-putting in terms of its tactility. So um, in a way, the, the patinas can reinforce to some extent, and here might reinforce the aliveness of the face, but at the same time, I don't find that any of these invite the touch quite so much as some of the patinas we see on the right It can be even aggressive. If you brush this one, I'm sure you're going to lose some of the threads of your <laughs> Perhaps at this point, we should move back into the auditorium and um, open it up to a wider debate. Okay.